So I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Ashok again for organizing such a very uh, comprehensive uh, summit for regenerative medicine. And it's always my honor to join this group. And uh, I would like to greet everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon in our country. And maybe good morning in your country. And uh, Dr. Gross, uh, maybe good morning. So wherever you are today, have a good day. So I'm going to discuss to you this afternoon uh, an ultrasound guided regenerative intervention for chronic MSK pain. So uh, as I always begin my talk with an inspirational uh, verse from this uh, book from ASI, which says, uh, God gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint. And to me, this is purely regenerative uh, intervention for all of us, because not every time we can actually solve the patient's problem that we're trying to treat. So let me start by saying that pain is a warning sign. It's actually considered to be one of the vital signs about tissue damage that is signaled by specific receptors and fiber systems from the site of injury, which is over the skin, its receptors, until it's being registered to the brain. And as I am uh, talking more about chronic pain and uh, MSK pain, let me just mention this as well, that chronic pain is not an extension of acute pain. It is actually as this writer have said, the result of the memory pain experience over time and is considered a disease state of the nervous system. And it is actually a problem that persists beyond its biological usefulness. And to some extent over time, it compromises the quality of life. So uh, if we have this, we know exactly that uh, it's bothersome experience and to some extent, it is really a disease by itself. So there are major types of chronic pain. And when we say chronic pain, these are pain that lasts longer than 12 weeks or more than three months. And then I just would like to uh, try to define some terms here so that we are on the same page as we go along in this discussion. So when we say nociceptive pain, these are pain that are emanating from damages in the tissues. So if there is any injury or any degenerative problems that affects the tissue itself, then you will call this the nociceptive pain. But neuropathic pain are those pain arising from the damage in the somatosensory fibers. And of course, these are kind of chain of nerve uh, injuries but the basic thing is there is a damage on that area. And of course, the third one could be a combination of nociceptive and of course, the neuropathic pain. Okay, so when we have pain, as all of us might have experienced in our lifetime, this kind of sensation will send signals to our C fibers. And then from these fibers, it goes through your thinly myelinated air delta sensory neurons. And once it activated, it goes through a series of other transmission until it reaches the brain. So that is the normal uh, link of how pain is perceived and felt by any one of us. But if there is damage in these receptors, due to some injury or lesion or disease, then that is where neuropathic pain develops. So it's a very specific definition where the receptors and the link that puts all these together are the one that is damaged during the process of neuropathic pain. So under normal circumstances, just a short review of our physiology, 
there are four phases of uh, pain sensation and it goes from one to the next. So it begins with a transduction. There is a stimuli that sends signals through the C and A delta fiber. And then from there, it is transmitted to your spinal cord, specifically at the dorsal horn through an afferent nociceptor located in the dorsal root ganglion. Then it ascends two levels on the same side and then cross to the other side through your anterior white commissure. And then it ascends upwards through your lateral spinothalamic tract to your brainstem and then passing through the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of your thalamus and then eventually to your somatosensory cortex of the brain. So that is where the pain signals are transmitted to the brain. Then at the level of the thalamus and cortex, there we can have the perception of pain as to their quality, as to their location, and of course, the intensity of pain. But somehow between the sensation and up to its level to the brain, it could be modulated. In other words, there could be some fibers that could influence the pain sensation. And these are due to the presence of other substances, which is located in the dorsal horn in the form of opioids, serotonin, norepinephrine, and gamma aminobutyric acid. And this kind of uh, substances binds to the afferent and dorsal horn and then it kind of modulate or inhibit pain transmission. So while we are focusing on a particular pain, let me just bring you towards the neuropathic pain, which our talk will concentrate on. So we were saying that neuropathic pain as defined by the IASP is caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. It could be central neuropathic pain, or it could be a peripheral neuropathic pain as indicated here in these slides right here. In the, it affects a substantial number of people in each country and that it could be perceived as pain. Now note here that CRPS is not included. This is specifically CRPS1 because there, were, there is no lesion in the somatosensory system and it is really intact. So. That's why we, we don't include this in the classification. So these are the distribution of both the peripheral and the central neuropathic pain. And I will not be labored to discuss all of this, but just going to show you that this is how we uh, identify between the peripheral and the central neuropathic pain. So as, uh, as mentioned earlier, we have the nociceptive, which is actually uh, disease affecting the tissues itself. And we always felt that. And it is characterized as either aching, throbbing, dull, or sharp. In contrast to the neuropathic pain, which we earlier said is a problem that affects the somatosensory structures. And uh, it is characterized as continuous burn-like shooting or paroxysmal. And there is an allodynia, which means that what used to be just a, a tactile sensation is perceived as pain, or there could be an increased uh, shooting of pain. We were initially, it is not uh, painful. So there could be a negative and positive symptoms such as your sensory loss or numbness and the positive symptoms like your paresthesias and of course your pain itself. So neuropathic pain can affect any of these areas as shown here in this slide. So it could be in the brain, it could be in the uh, spinothalamic tract, it could be in the afferent neurons, it could be at the sensation part, so at the receptors. So wherever there is lesion in any of these structures, then that is what we refer to as neuropathic pain. Now, in order to diagnose properly what is a neuropathic pain, then we need to identify these two factors that should be present. There should be number one, a continuing pain that is disproportionate to any inside event. In other words, it is a very simple injury, but it turns out to be very, very painful and not proportionate to that one that is causing the pain. And the patient must at least report one symptom in three of the four categories 
or one symptom in two of the four following categories affecting the sens sensory, basomotor, pseudomotor, which is like edema, motor or trophic changes affecting the, uh, I, the, the muscle itself or the nerve itself that could go, uh, turn out to be some changes in the, in the area which is causing the pain. Of course, there are other screening tools that we can use, which I also mentioned in these slides here. So we have the central sensitization of neuropathic pain. And this is really when the pain happens to affect the brain and the spinal cord, where there is an increased excitability, transduction, and a neurons, neurotransmitter release because of an increased sodium influx into the cells. It used to be that the sodium is found at the extracellular level, but then there is an increased influx of sodium. There is an increased influx of calcium into the cells. And this will enhance the excitatory synaptic transmission and eventually leads to pain. There are a lot of other mediators that we identify here, like your NMDA, which leads to a series of other substances which are causing the pain, like the release of glutamate and influx of calcium and sodium, uh, even at the level of the cells itself in the receptors. And then of course, we have your AMPAR or alpha amino 3 hydroxy 5 methyl 4 isoxazole propionic acid receptor. And these are a channel which actually can change depending on the responses and the stress that the cells is experiencing. And then as a result of this, there is a development of or increase of spontaneous activity, which is interpreted as pain. And this is your central sensitization. Well, at the level of the periphery, we also have its own uh, mechanism. And uh, much of uh, what was mentioned earlier by Dr. Gross will, will also be repeated here, like the presence of inflammatory cytokines, the TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, beta, interleukin-6, which are considered to be the inflammatory mediators, the prostaglandin, the bradykinin, the nerve gut factor. And this, in return, will also influence the response of the cells at the receptor sites. Interestingly, the microglia, which is also uh, found both in the central nervous systems, are also activated. And in return, this will initiate a series of reactions that will also release all these inflammatory mediators and eventually a neuropathic pain is perceived by the patients. Now, other explanation also has to do with the level of calcium that goes into the cells. We call that the sodium influx. And of course, the calcium influx that goes into the cell. Uh, and this is the one that increases the excitability of the nerves at the surface of the nerve itself, the receptor sites. And then patients will eventually feel that there is some kind of a pain uh, that, that is defined as the neuropathic pain. Now, for those of you who are doing uh, prolotherapy, this uh, slide may be very familiar because this slide will show you that it's not only those two mechanisms, but it has also has to do with the transient receptor valinoid channels. And these two receptors are the ones which initiate all those responses that will enhance also the calcium influx and the sodium influx, and then give rise to all the releases of these substances like your leukotrienes and prostaglandins and your inflammatory cytokines and causing neuropathic pain. And that is why if you block these receptors, the TRPV1, TRPA1, it kind of relieve the pain that the patient will experience. Interestingly also, I just included this. Uh, this is a study done last 2020 by the group of Lean and uh, what we can see here is even the food that we eat, its interaction at the surface of the epithelial level at the gut can also give rise to either it enhances or it could suppress the release of mediators that can cause neuropathic pain. That is why it is very important that we also take note of what we eat because it really matters what we put into our stomach because it influences the kind of sensation that will eventually be felt by the patient. And so uh, as part of the protocol, then we can also make use of 
identifying what are inflammatory food that can actually enhance the pain to the patient. And of course, uh, it could be a combined role of central and peripheral sensitization. And this happens at the receptor sites and also at the dorsal root ganglion in the spinal cord. And I will not labor to explain everything, but the, the bottom line here is that it releases all those inflammatory cytokines that will co cause neuroinflammation and eventually seal cell death. So how much of the population is experiencing this? So usually uh, in all of the uh, studies, it usually range up to about 1% to about 9.8%. Sometimes the report up to 10%. So this is uh, not much, but if you convert it, it, always, it almost converts about 20 million people in a country like the United States uh, complaining of neuropathic pain. So how do we diagnose this by ultrasound? So as you see, uh, the ultrasound is a very important tool in trying to characterize a normal peripheral nerve and abnormal peripheral nerve. So as you can see in this slide, you can see a normal nerve which is, which is uh, characterized by a honeycomb pattern in its short axis view. And of course, a tram track pattern in long axis view. So without, no, without any sign of notching or change in the fascicular pattern of the nerve. So this is considered the normal uh, peripheral nerve uh, by ultrasound. But also other than the nerve itself, we will notice that there could be some changes depending on the extent and the duration of the injury of the nerve. For example, if we are like looking at it from a very early stage, then we can just see an hypoechogenicity of the nerve at the very early part of our diagnosis. Then eventually, as we go along, there could be a, a hypoechoic swelling of the nerve. In other words, one part of the nerve is swollen, the other is not. And then if you put your probe right where you are trying to inject, you, can, you will notice that there is tenderness or pain in the area where you are trying to check the nerve. Eventually, if there is no intervention done with this particular nerve, then the muscle innervated by the nerve could also turn to be abnormal with signs of muscle atrophy. So if you see that, that means you're dealing with the nerve that has been impinged for a long period of time already. And that is why there are some changes that you see in the muscle itself. So what are the patterns of peripheral nerve injury? So it could be a decreased ecogenicity of an abnormal peripheral nerve. So as you look at the nerve, it looks like you don't see the fascicles in the, in the middle. So the, 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 the color is kind of darker as compared when it's uh, usually uh, normal, which is a little lighter. Then if you put the power Doppler, there is an abnormal hypervascularity. And then there is also a hypoechoic swelling, but the fascicles are still preserved. To some extent, it could, there could be signs of notching. So as you can see here, shown in the slides on the right below, uh, the one on the C side is the normal and A and B are both abnormal. One fascicle is swollen than the rest, or it could be a collective swelling of the entire uh, nerve as an indication of an abnormal nerve. So for example, we're dealing with a neuropraxia. In a neuropraxia, there is usually a diffuse hypoechoic swelling of the median nerve, but the, the fascicles are still preserved. So if you take a look at the cross-sectional area, it could be more than the usual, this is a median nerve. So this is normally at 0 0.10, but you can see here that it, it goes up to 0 0.15. And usually the, there is no notching yet. So it looks normal, although there are some uh, diffuse changes in the fascicles, but uh, in general, the size is still considered to be uniform. Dealing with axonotmesis, which is actually another injury of the nerve, there could be a diffuse hypoechoic swelling, but there is an accompanied loss of fascicular pattern and the nerve caliper is usually irregular. So as you can see here, there's already signs of notching. Now this indicates that there is some damage to the axons, but the epineurium, endoneurium, swan cell tubes and other supporting structures are still preserved. There is a distal valerian degeneration, but there is still hope for regeneration to the distal peripheral nerve. 
So both the neuroprexion axonotmesis, if we treat this, there's still a way by which these nerves can regenerate. And so it could be classified into either mild, moderate, or severe. In this case, it's a mild axonotmesis. There is only a diffuse swelling, but the fascicles are still preserved. Or it could be the extreme, which is severe axonotmesis, wherein there is not only swelling, but there is a loss of fascicular pattern and presence of intraneural fluid, and there is an accompanying irregular nerve caliber. So if you see this, then that's a sign that you're dealing with a severe type of axonotmesis. And of course, the last one, which is the extreme one, is when the nerve is really severed or crushed or disrupted or transected. And so you don't see quite the nerve in the middle. So we call this the empty bed appearance. And the ends of the nerve are retracted at both ends. And this is a severe type of peripheral nerve injury. And for us, it's important to realize that there is no possibility of nerve regeneration in, the, in this kind of injury. And then of course, when there is fibrosis, then that will compound the problem where regeneration could not occur. To some extent also, there could just be a painful neuroma. So a neuroma is there is a bulbous a terminal uh, in the terminal part of the, of the peripheral nerve. And if you touch it, it's very, very painful. So in ultrasound, you can see it as a hypoechoic swelling at the terminal end of the nerve. There could be uh, a bizarre disorganized pattern. And uh, grossly, if you open it up, then you can see the, the terminal ends of the nerve to be really, really uh, huge and uh, very sensitive because of the fibers trying to find its way to regenerate outside, but could not. And so it forms like a bulbous thing at the terminal end of the, of the axon or the, of the peripheral nerve. Now, for those who doesn't like to do an ultrasound, then EMG is also one way of identifying a lesion of the peripheral nerve. And the good thing about this, if you, if you do both MSK with EMG, then your sensitivity will increase from 78% to 98%. So ph pharmacologic and interventional procedures for this. Now, if you look at this, these are drugs that we tend to use, and I just, included this because uh, I know that some of you are still using it. And these are really great drugs that we can incorporate uh, as an initial treatment for patients with neuropathic pain. And of course, I just also highlight here the possibility that if you are doing uh, a blind procedure versus fluoroscopic procedure versus just palpation and ultrasound, you can see the difference of how accurate it could be if you're using it under ultrasound guidance. So, you can just see here all the different areas and how ultrasound can be very useful in identifying the sparks in the joint, in the tendons, in the bursa. Also here uh, in the lower extremity, the same thing, ultrasound with palpation versus fluoroscopy, very important uh, uh, modality that we can incorporate in our practice. And then of course, these are the summary of studies which also differentiate between the use of landmark guided versus an ultrasound guided. So if you're injecting, it's always important to use it under ultrasound guidance rather than just landmark guidance to be able to accurately target the site where you are trying to inject. Uh, same holds true here at the lower extremity. You can see here all the studies that shows the advantage of using it, a procedure under ultrasound guidance. And here also the continuation for the knee joint and the foot and ankle as well. So uh, for those of you who are uh, doing injection, uh, let me just mention this. Uh, um, maybe there are techniques that you have learned in the past, but I just would like to mention here the, the, the thing that you do not need to do. So the first thing is do not move the transducer and the needle at the same time, or do not advance the probe to find the needle if you don't see it because you might actually puncture a structure that is very vital. And then you're just trying to use your probe to look for it. The best technique is to remove the needle again and go to the target by your ultrasound and find it by your probe, not by your needle. And of course, if you are dealing with an irregular surface, 
then we say it's a sterile gel standoff technique so that you can see the entire structure the moment the needle hits the skin. And these are different areas where you inject that might be the reason for, for causing all those pains when you do an injection. So here, for instance, in the, in the knee joint, uh, the approach would be at the supra uh, patellar area at the, at the bursa in order not to puncture to the meniscus that might get a, a, a across and you might give additional injury to that area when you are trying to approach it in the knee joint. Then of course, you can also uh, do a ultrasound guided uh, injection. In this case, uh, uh, I'm trying to inject the glenohumeral joint in posteriorly in plane to the needle. And of course, uh, you can see the entire shaft, the tip, where it's going, whether it's going into your, into your uh, joint or not. So it is very important that you see everything when you try to uh, incorporate your solution into the joint. Now, this one is uh, uh, an anterior glenohumeral joint injection. So it's the, the approach is anterior. So it, it could be challenging for some of you, but uh, because you can only see the point of the needle with this kind of technique. So it's very important that you see also where you're uh, going into. And uh, this could be very difficult for some of you, but this could be easy to some as well. Or it could be an injection of uh, the PIP joint. And so you can use the walk, the walk down method from the most superior surface of the skin. You go walk down until you reach the joint where your target would be. Because this is actually a, a technique which is out of plane, but of course, long access to the structure that you're looking at. And the same holds true when you're doing it in the hip joint, you, you inject it at the uh, capsule right at the uh, head neck junction because that is where you have to deliver the drug. How about for the tendons? Uh, the same holds true for the tendons, you can inject it. Okay, so this is a comparison between corticosteroids, prolotherapy, and of course, orthobiologics. So if you want a short-term effect, you can use corticosteroids. The effect doesn't last more than two months, or you can use uh, prolotherapy at least six months or orthobiologic that can go up to about one to two years. So this one is uh, uh, an injection that uh, we, we, we did for uh, the supraspinatus tendon. And uh, as you can see here, we're trying to put the needle inside the tendon itself as I approach since I'm initially putting some anesthesia in the process. So I have to inject uh, to the nerve, uh, to the track, so that the patient might not feel so much pain in the process. Of course, for your hamstring, the same holds true. So when it is guided, you can see the structure that you're targeting uh, right here. How about the bursa? This is even more challenging because uh, if you do it blindly, you would not be able to see where the bursa really is. So in this case, it's a very big bursa of the subacromial subdeltoid so bursa of the, of the shoulder. And you can use your Doppler to guide you to be able to assist you and see that you're not puncturing any vital structures. And then you can just remove the fluid that may be causing the pain, but at the same time, you can just unscrew the syringe and put the uh, solution that you're going to put during the process. The same holds true with your iliopsoas, and this is uh, a transverse uh, approach in playing to the needle, but of course, short access to the structures that you're targeting, let's say your psoas and ilio, uh, il, iliacus muscles. You can also do this at the bursa on the lateral hip. When you experience some external snapping, then uh, we know that uh, it involves usually the gluteus medius, and uh, it could also affect rarely the greater trochanteric bursa. We always think it's a bursa, but actually it's a gluteus medius tendon. Same holds true with your ischial bursa uh, in this case. So what about the peripheral nerve? So when we do the peripheral nerve, then of course we have to identify both the short and long axis and just see 
exactly where we are approaching. So you can see here the long axis view compared to the uh, short axis view of the nerve. And then you can see the echo texture trying to differentiate between how the tendon looks like versus how the nerve looks like. And so you know exactly where your target would be. And then of course, let's say you are doing it in the carpal tunnel syndrome, in a very swollen carpal tunnel syndrome, the major nerve is swollen right here. So you can just uh, measure it. And then uh, you can see here how it's related to the rest of the tendons, okay? And then of course, this is also a, an image of a failed uh, carpal tunnel syndrome surgery. And you can see here the hypertrophic scar. And then uh, you can immediately say, see how you will have to approach the major nerve when you hydrodesect this area. So right here, you can have to hydrodesect both the superficial layer of the major nerve and of course, deep to the nerve to be able to completely hydrodesect the major nerve. And the approach that I've done is from ulnar to radial. Okay, so it's actually short axis to the structures that I'm trying to inject, but it is in plane to the probe. And then you can do the same way for lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is between your sartorius and tensor fascia lata. This is a very frequent uh, a pain problem on the lateral thigh. And you can also do your uh, uh, hydrodesection of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve in order to remove any impingement on that side of the, of the nerve in order to uh, remove any source of uh, impingement, mechanical impingement on that area. Now, I will not deal more on the other things on the platelet reach so deep because it was already mentioned by the first lecturer a while ago, but let me just mention here the effectiveness of PRP for diabetic neuropathic pain. So could it make a difference? So this is a study published 2019. So the study concluded that it is an effective therapy for alleviation of diabetic neuropathy pain and numbness and enhancement of peripheral nerve function. So there is a nerve growth factor that is found in the PRP and this nerve growth factor is kind of guides the nerve as to exactly where it should go. You can see the here that even if the nerve is still a candidate for regeneration, it could not just go into the sheath itself where the nerve should go inside in order to follow the usual uh, perineural uh, cover of the nerve. So the nerve growth factor will help it identify or to some extent, if it, is, it, if it happens a long time ago or it could be a post release fibrosis can be present that could block the growth of the nerve. So those are factors that you can try to consider what may be causing why there is some problems in the regeneration. So, and then of course with the PRP here, then it could guide exactly where the nerve should, should, should proceed when you actually hydrodissect that area. I just mentioned this slide in relation to the previous one that I've mentioned because we can incorporate probiotics and other interventions in order to strategize patients' interventions for neuropathic pain. So that also means that we have to avoid inflammatory diet that could cause the, the pain to be enhanced and hyper-excitable. So this study is telling us that it's really a, a combination of all other therapies in order to come up with a very effective uh, results or solution to our problem. Now, what about the alpha to macroglobulin? Now, this uh, solution is very interesting in the sense that it has the capability of inhibiting matrix metalloproteases and of course, inflammatory cytokines such as TNF alpha, interleukin one beta and interleukin six. And it acts in a way that is very specific to those structures. Other than the nerve, it is also a potential treatment for cartilage-based pathology and inflammatory arthritis. It could be the mild to moderate, it could be the post-traumatic OA, the antisopathies, or spinal dystogenic pain. And it has the ability to disrupt the catabolic process of cartilage degeneration and enhance 
cartilage regeneration. So right here, this is an E2M concentrator uh, made by Cytonics. Uh, E2M will inhibit these proteases and then it has also the capability, as I've said, to bind with TNF alpha, interleukin one, beta interleukin six. And these inflammatory cytokines are the one that's causing a lot of pain in those joints mentioned. Of course, uh, from previous lectures that I made, we found out that these inflammatory cytokines are found in the knee and the quest and the joints. And the question of why is it that it keeps coming back repeatedly? And we found out in the studies that it is because of the presence of these inflammatory cytokines. It keeps releasing and unless we block it, it will just keep coming and the pain will just keep coming. And of course, uh, it suppresses inflammation and of course, alter the course of peripheral nerve injury. It also regulates the progression of peripheral nerve injury. So as you can see here, the TNF alpha is a biomarker of valerian degeneration. So we know exactly what's gonna happen if it is present. So here we can see the difference between difference between the normal nerve and the peripheral nerve. And as you can see here, there's just a lot of these toxic substances that is a result of the microglia that was activated and then it lodges on the joint. And this is the one also that initiates the release of substance P, the calcitonin G, reactive peptides, so CRGRP or and the glutamate. And all of this contributes to the pain that the patient is experiencing. So as you can see here, the inflammatory cytokines is not only found in the nerve, it's also found in the joints. So if you look back and read back your books on pathology, you will actually discover that this is the ingredient that causes a lot of pain right in your joints and right in your nerves. So the same. So how does it work? It works like at a bait and trap method. It traps the inflammatory cytokines. And once it traps the inflammatory cytokines, then it releases it for uh, excretion. And so when you have this inflammatory, uh, this HOM, it kind of works by trying to trap all these inflammatory uh, solutions in your uh, joints and nerves. So here, this is a study published in 2019. So there is a, a biomarker mapping for neuropathic pain. And they found out that A2M is decreased in the neuropathic pain mouse model. So in other words, there is, seems to be a positive or a, or a decrease in the amount of the substance. And that could be the reason why neuropathic pain persists. So also in this same study, so they, they kind of make an A2M and a derivative of it to enhance its active, its binding capacity with, with inflammatory cytokines. And in this study, it shows that it inhibits interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, interleukin-18, and of course, the TNF-alpha. So it's very interesting how this substance really works. And uh, I also did a publication of trying to explain all of these uh, processes and how it tries to inhibit and counteract the effect of matrix metalloproteases and their inflammatory cytokines. Now, in a recent study published 2020, now they made a study for a thoracic outlet syndrome and of course, uh, affecting also the brachial plexus. And they tried to uh, do it using the combined A2M PPP. As you can see, the A2M is derived from the PPP portion of the PRP. So sometimes you didn't choose the PPP and we can actually use that PPP to be able to uh, get the A2M in there. And then of course, uh, six months in this study, they have a very significant improvement for those patients treated with A2M, uh, including and not limited to, to the thoracic outlet syndrome, but also to so CRPS as well. Also, uh, this is a 2017 study of A2M for back pain. But uh, here, they, they would like to first identify if those patients are 
fibronectin uh, FAC positive patients. So uh, fibronectin agrican complex positive patients. So here, if you are FAC positive, so not all the disc problems are FAC positive, and these are the ones released. Uh, these are uh, metabolic substance released when there is a discogenic pain. They found out that there is an improvement of pain when patients who are FAC positive are injected with autologous ATM injection. But first, we have to identify if they are FAC positive. So here, uh, they also use uh, different uh, disability and uh, pain scale in order to see how it works, those which are treated and those which doesn't have a treatment. So as you can see here, there's a significant difference of those not treated and those treated with A2M. Now, this is a very new study uh, published 2021, new biomaterials for degenerative disc disease. And the question is, do we need to remove it or do we need to regenerate it? So here you can see that there are new biomaterials that we can incorporate in our treatment. And we have already mentioned the PRP and maybe some would talk about bo bone morphogenic protein or transforming growth factor, but also it mentions alpha-2 macroglobulin or A2M as part of the biomaterials just published uh, early this month, 2021, that could help in improving the success for painful degenerative disc disease. Of course, we have a lot of other things which I would not be mentioning here, I would not be discussing here. I mean, so it includes your bone marrow, adipose, peripheral blood, umbilical cord. So some people will, our speakers will be discussing uh, this in detail. So I would like to leave this message to all of you. So Abraham Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the ax and the last two hours chopping down the tree. So I hope you got the meaning of this, that uh, we want to really learn a lot, but and to, to give relief to our patients, but we should be spending more time really honing our skills rather than just going into the needle and just injecting it right away. Perfecting skills before doing it. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And of course, God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Castro for your excellent talk. And uh, there's one quick question from one of the participants. Where do you inject actually in diabetic neuropathy? And what product do you prefer? Okay. Uh, I usually start with PRP first for diabetic neuropathy. And usually uh, I use ultrasound to identify what nerves are involved, especially they are usually affecting the distal nerves of either the legs or the lower limb. So I have to go through all of these nerves if it, it could include your peroneal nerve, your tibial nerve, and all its uh, branches. And it is always important to map the exact area so you know exactly what is the nerve involved. And then I would do hydrodissection on those nerves that are affected because you can actually see them if it is swollen and the ultrasound can help you identify which nerves are really involved and inject it on those nerves that are affected. It holds true with the upper extremity. So everything has to be guided and everything has to be mapped out in order to be sure that you're dealing with a specific area and not just injecting it anywhere you want. So how many sessions normally you do? Uh, for PRP, I would do uh, at least three. And then if after three months of follow-up, I don't see any significant improvement, that's where I do A to M. So I would A to M as like uh, the, the ultimate treatment